This week we're talking about evidence-based practice and culturally competent assessments. Uh, I already recorded the lecture, except I think the mute was on because there's no sound. So now I'm re-recording it, which is great. That's super frustrating. That's uh, awesome. So <laughs> this is going to be short uh, because you guys have, it was short to begin with, and now it's probably going to be shorter now that I'm re-recording. Um, you guys have your midterm coming up and it's pretty hefty. So I want to make sure to give you guys ample time to focus on that. So evidence based practices. How do we as clinicians decide what treatment to use? How do we know what's going to be best or most successful or useful for our clients? There are several things to keep in mind when deciding what treatment to use, who the client is and how relevant or appropriate will this approach be for that specific client. Evidence-based practice in psychology has been defined as the integration of the best approach available in terms of like what research has been done, um, your clinical expertise, and paying attention to the context of the client, their characteristics, culture preferences. So you've kind of got these three things going on that you have to be paying attention to. Basically, um, evidence-based practice is saying treatment needs to have research behind it. You know, like this is based on all of this research that's been done on cognitive behavioral therapy, on EMDR, on whatever different therapy approaches out there. All this research shows that it is effective with this client, with this specific presenting concern, say depression or anxiety or bipolar or whatever it is. And so therefore, that's how we know that if Whoever is in front of you, this treatment will, you know, more than likely um, be also useful for them as long as, you know, we talk, do some of the things that we already have talked about in terms of like tailoring it specifically to their characteristics, cultures, all the things that I just said. Um, Evidence-based practice has been validated, so a lot of empirical research has been done. When we talk about evidence-based practices specifically, they're usually uh, brief and very standardized. So some type of manual has been created. So you can open up the manual and say, all right, here, here's you know step one, step two, step three, es essentially, um, which can be effective. That's also the reason why some people don't like it because they feel like, oh, it's too rigid. I have to follow these exact rules and that just doesn't feel comfortable or that doesn't feel helpful for the client. And, and the reason for the manual is because, you know, if you go and do research, you show, okay, step one, step two, step three, if we do these three steps with this specific group of clients, um, it's shown to be helpful. Um, and so the idea then is that you can take that and use it with your client, but sometimes um, that type of rigorous research doesn't capture the fact that humans are very unique and everyone who sits in front of you is going to be different than the next person or the last person. And so that's where you really have to tailor things, um, which is why I've got the picture of a cake here. Uh, the idea here being that, you know, you might have someone who is gluten free. And so in that case, you, you know, have to substitute out something for wheat and, um, you know, make the cake batter with something that's gluten friendly. Um, if you have someone, a client who, you know, has specific characteristics in you in the analogy of making cake here, they're dairy free or they don't want eggs. You might have to substitute out the eggs and use something, an alternative option. And so that's the way to use manuals and evidence-based practice in a way that still works for your client is like, how do I, you know, take the research, what is shown to be helpful, but also match it to the client and make sure that the two kind of merge together to be successful for whoever is sitting in front of me. Um, so kind of tailoring the cake batter, if you will, um, to the individual needs. Uh, let's see, anything else that we want to talk about in terms of evidence-based practices? I already talked about how some providers don't, some therapists don't like it because it feels very manualized. It can feel kind of very uh, mechanistic, uh, overly rigid. Um, some individuals feel like because of that, it doesn't have the individual therapy um, approach, uh, but that's where you just kind of bake it in, as I talked about, in terms of paying attention to and tailoring it to those individual characteristics and variabilities that are going to come with, you know, person to person. Another, one other negative to mention in terms of treatments is that many treatments are very westernized. I think maybe we've already talked about that. A lot of them have either been developed in Europe or are, or America or were based on um, research or um, theories, you know, think back to Freud. Um, he developed, you know, he's kind of the, he's the father of psychology. He developed theories and then people developed theories based off of that. And so paying attention to 
you know, now there are more Eastern based therapies, um, things that are, you know, kind of more based in like Buddhism or mindfulness or that type of thing. Um, so paying attention to if it's something that's Western, it might not necessarily translate or be as helpful for um, different cultural um, populations out there. And so looking for, okay, for CBT, for example, is there um, a treatment modality or option that has cultural adaptations baked within, um, you know, that therapy or that approach? Or how do I, um, you know, make those adaptations to meet my specific client's needs? Empirically supportive relationships. So this is just talking about, I think we've talked quite a bit at this point in the semester about how the relationship with our client, us and the client, that relationship that we build is the biggest and most important skill that we as counselors can have because that relationship, research has shown, strongly impacts the outcome of therapy in terms of does this person improve, do they get better, do they you know, achieve their goals, that type of thing. And so, of course, there's a lot of important things that go into that in terms of like empathy, in terms of um, taking a collaborative approach, which I'll talk a little bit more here in a minute, um, and making sure that we're managing some other things in terms of transference to counter-transference, which I'll talk about here in a minute as well. So, of course, in terms of that therapeutic alliance, it's things like empathy, which I just talked about. It's respect. It's genuineness. Clients can tell if you're being genuine with them or if you're kind of being coming off as being fake or, um, you know, not being true to yourself. Um, and so try and be genuine with individuals. Be warm towards them. Show that you actually care about them. Um, you know, not that you're just there to get a paycheck or, or something like that. And we've talked about self-disclosure previously. Use self-disclosure as needed and as when appropriate for the or most helpful for the client. Um, clients reported that part of what contributed to success in treatment was a sense of connection with their therapist as well as feeling respected and understood. So, you know, how likely are you to keep going to see someone, a therapist, a counselor, if you don't feel connected to them, if you don't feel like they care about you, you're probably going to be like, this isn't actually helpful or useful. Um, and, or think about a family friend or, um, you know, a loved one, a sister, a brother, a parent, a sibling, whoever, if they were going to a therapist and they're like, you know, I just, this isn't clicking, this isn't working, I don't really feel like this person actually cares about me, would you tell them to continue to go to that therapist? No, you would say like, oh, well, if it's not working, go find someone else. Um, so again, paying attention to that connectedness is such a huge aspect of our work with clients in terms of enabling, um, you know, the client to feel supported, to um, their ability to use that support to then go make change happen, for them to feel um, like there's equality in the relationship as opposed to them feeling inferior to the relationship or like, well, you're the expert. Let me rely on what you have to say. Like, no, they are the expert of their lives. How can they use that expertise of their own life? They're the ones living their lives to then use that to um, achieve the goals that they want to achieve in treatment. You guys probably know by now that I really like Brene Brown stuff. So I added this little video in here. It's like three to four minutes long and it talks about empathy and I really like, it, it's done really well and I think it helps understand empathy versus sympathy. So I'll put the link in the description. SMART goals, I work on this with the client towards the end of the intake session or at the very first follow-up session with the client, depending on how much time we have at the end of the intake session. So the intake session, if you don't know, it's where um, you try and get to know the client a little bit, get to know what they're coming to therapy for, what they want to focus on, um, what are the problems, what's the history of the problem, family history, um, all that type of stuff. And so we'll focus on SMART goals because a lot of times clients come in and they'll say something like, I just want to be happier. And it's like, okay, well, what does that mean? You know, like, how will you know that you're happier? How will, what will be different in your life? You know, what ha will have changed at the end of therapy or in your life in general for you to be happier? Sometimes clients will say things like, well, I want to feel less depressed or less an anxious. And it's like, okay, well, it's hard to, you know, how, how are you going to measure that? How are you going to know that you're less anxious or less depressed? 
Um, and if we're focusing on something that we don't want to be experiencing, is that really a helpful goal? Like, well, you know, like research has shown that you want to be focusing on what what is the experience that you want to be having or what is the goal that you do want to achieve as opposed to that negative. So if we're looking at, well, I want to experience less depression, well, how will you know that you're experiencing less depression if you literally, you know, like if you're getting to a point where you're experiencing less of it, but maybe there's still a little bit as opposed to a complete absence or zero of depression or depressive symptoms. And so I'll work with the client to reframe that to, well, what do you want to be experiencing? And, you know, they might say something like, well, I want to be, um, I want to be more engaged with family. I want to enjoy my life more. I want to be, you know, doing activities that I used to enjoy doing, but I'm not enjoying anymore. And so then we'll base, you know, we'll create some goals based on that. And I like to really break it down and really kind of get into the weeds here with clients so that we can kind of create um, a picture or an idea of exactly what they're trying to achieve. And so we'll use SMART goals to look at that and try and make sure that it's, you know, specific. So if a client says, well, I want to be happier, like, well, that's not very specific. That's really vague. That's really open-ended. How will you know that you've achieved that? Whereas as opposed to if the client says something like, um, what's a better example? Like I want to be happier when I'm spending time with my family. Like, okay, well now we, that's more specific, right? So now we can start to break down, well, what will you be feeling in that moment? Will, will you be thinking, um, you know, so that that way we can start to measure some of those things. Like, how are you currently feeling when you're with your family? How will you know that based on your, your baseline, like this is how I'm currently feeling, that you've now achieved what you said you want to achieve in terms of being happier specifically when you're spending time with your family. Um, and then we'll create some things that are achievable around that. And then, um, you know, make sure that there's something timely. So if a, timely is things that are like, okay, well, is that really realistic? So for example, if a, if a client comes in and says, I want to complete, you know, a master's program in six months, like, well, that's probably not realistic if you're starting right now, you know, like maybe there's a program out there, but is it this program specifically that you want to achieve? Um, you know, is it the program, is it a program that's going to be worth your time and effort or is it just a paper mill where it's not going to have any actual value to you? Um, and then realistic. So realistic is things like, you know, if a client says something like, uh, I've never had a client say this, but just as an example, if a client says something like, well, you know, my mom passed away and I want, you know, my goal is for therapy is to bring my mom back. Like, well, I don't have magical skills. That's not realistic. Um, you know, usually it's, I, I, that's probably a poor example, but you guys get what I'm saying. Like a, a goal should be something that's like, okay, that can actually be <clears throat> achievable. It's realistic to actually achieve that as opposed to, oh, here's a, here's a better example. If a client says something like, I want to, you know, there, um, he or she is with a, uh, uh, say she is with a, someone who is abusing alcohol, for example. Um, if, if she says, you know, my goal for treatment is to um, completely fix my boyfriend and get him to stop using alcohol and for us to have, you know, a, a perfect life together. Well, that's not realistic um, because you can't force him to change. You can't make him change. And so unless he wants to change and quit using alcohol on, you know, for himself, then you trying to make him change is just going to result in a lot of frustration, a lot of anger. Um, and ultimately, he's just going to continue to use until he gets to a point where he's ready to make that change. Transference and countertransference, like, I think we've kind of already talked about this, but transference is where the client feels something towards us as the therapist based on their background, based on friends or family that they know, based on previous life experiences. Countertransference is when we as the therapist feel something towards the client. Um, an example of this is when I was on internship, I was working with someone who, um, had been in therapy for several years. He would come and see me and it kind of felt like he just was coming to vent. Like he wasn't actually, you know, we would talk about homework or talk about doing homework and then he would never, he never did it at the follow-up. Um, and anytime we tried to, you know, anytime we started to really kind of dig into something and get serious, he would, he would kind of suddenly pop up with like, oh, I've been having these suicidal thoughts. And then that would kind of overtake or become the focus of that therapy session. And so 
um, I eventually started to feel a lot of frustration towards this person. Um, and it was something that I had to process through in therapy because, you know, I was like, he keeps coming back, but he's not actually making any changes. Like he doesn't, you know, um, it doesn't feel like he actually wants to get better or it feels like he just kind of uses this to vent and doesn't actually, um, you know, want his life to change at all. And so that was something that I had to work through in terms of um, getting supervision from, from my supervisor at the time. Um, when we have counter-transference to someone else, that can bias our judgment in terms of working with the client. Um, or we could actually accidentally or inappropriately project those emotions onto the client. So it's good to either get our own therapy or our own supervision or consultation around those things to make sure that it's not in negatively impacting our work with the client. Um, so culturally competent, I've already talked, I think, quite a bit about like increasing awareness, increasing awareness around our own beliefs, values, assumptions, what we bring into the room with us. Um, so I won't go into that, uh, but you can see how there's kind of different levels of awareness or things to be paying attention to in terms of like knowledge, skills, that type of thing. So there are a couple things that we, other things that we also want to be paying attention to and increase awareness of in terms of some of those um, biases or errors that we might have. Um, kind of little tricks of the brain that can be helpful in a lot of situations, but can also be very unhelpful. Um, so for example, confirmatory strategy, this is searching for evidence or information that supports one's hypothesis. So for in this example, our hypothesis about a client and ignores data um, that's inconsistent with this perspective. So what's an example of this? Um, I was working with a psychiatrist and we were seeing the same client. Um, and so I went to him about consultation and he said, well, I'm diagnosing bipolar because, um, you know, she, she likes to color her hair really wild colors. Like she colored her hair blue. Um, she's, you know, having sex with different men. And I was like, okay, but yeah, a lot of people like to color their hair different colors nowadays. And she's a, you know, young 20 something year old female. If, if this were a male sitting in front of you and he was having sex with different people, you know, like, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, whatever on Tinder or whatever it is, you would have no issue with it because that's very normal for a man. But because she's a female, you think that she's acting impulsively and she's, you know, you're diagnosing bipolar. Um, and he ignored that data or ignored like that conversation and said like, well, that's your opinion. I'm, you know, I see what I see. I'm going to diagnose bipolar. Um, and so because he was, you know, almost kind of specifically looking for something or had some, and there was a couple other factors, you know, in their case that, um, I won't go into, but because he kind of already specifically had this idea of like, oh, well, she's probably bipolar. He took that information, um, from the interview and said like, well, this is what I'm diagnosing and ignored some other data that was like, all right, well, maybe bipolar isn't necessarily going on here. Um, so that's confirmatory strategy. Attribution error. So this is placing an undue emphasis on internal causes regarding a client's program. So for example, thinking a problem stems from a personal characteristic rather than the client, rather than considering the client's environment or um, social structure explanations. So for example, um, you know, uh, John making up an example here, John might notice that, um, you know, that Amy is always showing up late to work or shown up late to work the last couple of days. And he might say, wow, Amy's really lazy. You know, she's, she shows up when she wants to, she's not very consistent. Um, and he might not being, you know, so he's placing the fact that she's running late on a personal characteristic that she's lazy, making an assumption or making this attribution error. Um, ignoring the fact that there might be, you know, environmental or sociocultural explanations. So for example, maybe she's a single mom, her kid has been sick the last couple of days. Um, because she's a single mom, she's the only one taking care of the kid. And she, you know, has to not only, you know, the kid's feeling sick, doesn't want to get out of bed, doesn't want to go to school or go to daycare or whatever. Um, but so she not only has to like drag the kid out of bed, but also take them to daycare or school or whatever it is. And so, um, when we, this is, I think that's where the empathy piece comes in is, is thinking about or paying attention to everyone has stuff going on in their lives. And so how do we make sure to pay attention or think about maybe it's just an environmental or a sociocultural factor going on and not some, this person's characteristics specifically. 
Um, sociocultural explanations that could be occurring is poverty, is discrimination, is oppression. So take that same example and say, um, you know, a John assumes or sees Amy and he says, man, she always, she's always wearing these clothes that don't really look good. She, she's always kind of wearing these drabby clothes and he might not be realizing or thinking about maybe she's, you know, maybe she's, um, making ends meet. Maybe she's putting money towards a sick parent or a sick kid or medical bills. And so she's, you know, she's got a good job, but maybe the finances are, there isn't enough money to be able to go buy nice clothes for the office so that she's dressed, um, you know, in a very nice way. And so just, yeah, those are some of the socio-cultural explanations that could be uh, at play. Diagnostic overshadowing. So this is making the assumption that um, with diagnostic overshadowing, it can happen if a clinician places too much emphasis on race or other diversity factors and makes assumptions about how those factors are impacting the client. Um, there's a couple good examples of this in the textbook, but essentially it's, um, you know, you take that factor and you almost kind of make it a mountain out of a molehill. You kind of like really blow it out of proportion um, as opposed to saying like, okay, well, does this fit with the cultural factors that are, you know, going on or with this client's specific life? Um, for example, have you ever gone to the doctor and, um, oh, moving on into considering all aspects of each client, have you ever, uh, gone to the doctor for something and then after the appointment was over either the same day you know you're like sitting in your car or you're driving away or the next day you're like oh crap I completely forgot to mention this to the doctor it's not that you're lying or trying to leave the information out you just forgot to bring it up during the appointment that happens a lot with our clients too and you'll see this more in interdisciplinary settings like say a medical setting if a client is seeing you and a psychiatrist as I just mentioned if you're consulting with them on the client's case, you know, you'll start to notice like, oh, well, the client told me certain things as the psychologist, but didn't tell you certain things as the psychiatrist, or maybe remembered to tell you as the psychiatrist certain things, but didn't mention that to me. Um, so for example, clients will, you know, completely like mention to one or the other, like, oh yeah, I'm having these difficulties with a spouse or, or a significant other, but then completely fail to bring that up. Um, in therapy. And part of that is, you know, depending on what the, what direction the conversation is going, maybe again, that person is just not bringing it up, or maybe they're like, well, you know, I've already talked about it with this other professional. Do I really need to mention it again? And so again, it's not necessarily that clients are, are lying, but they just might um, not always bring up information. And so it's important to remember that when we consider, you know, it's really difficult to consider all aspects like 360 everything in a client's life because there's just so much if a client sees us one hour out of a week or one hour every two weeks a lot can happen in a week or even two weeks and so we're not going to know every single tiny little thing about our clients we just go based off of the information we know and do the best that we can for our clients um other significance concerns this is Cultural factors are hugely important. I mean, the whole class is about that. But when factors such as suicide are present, um, I will focus on the suicidal piece, paying attention to, you know, if there's, of course, if there's cultural factors that are driving that. Um, but a lot of times that's more on the mental health side or kind of the depressive side is kind of really driving suicidal thoughts. Sometimes there can be some impulsivity there as well, but I will purely focus on the suicide until that comes off the table, until the client says, I'm no longer, you know, right now I'm kind of past that. I'm not feeling suicidal anymore. Um, then we can consider some of those other factors, but, um, that's something that it, because it's so important, it can become, you know, so deadly if a client does decide to have a suicide attempt that I will completely, um, not pay attention to other factors or pay less attention to other factors unless they're somehow contributing to the suicide until that is thoroughly addressed and we're able to move on from that. We've already kind of talked about the, the cookbook approach um, and we've talked quite a bit about, you know, not using stereotypes in this class. Heuristics. So this is what I was talking about in terms of heuristics are helpful. I think I said this at the beginning of the slide. I, I meant to say it for this slide. 
Heuristics are a mental shortcut or rule of thumb that helps us make decisions and judgments quickly. And that can be really helpful in situations. So if you think back to the last slide where I talked about, you know, John, John as a employer or as a boss, um, for that fake example with Amy, there might be heuristics that he's making mental shortcuts that are really helpful in terms of making, helping him make fast decisions at work that help the company, you know, um, out, out compete their competition. Um, but we saw in those examples how heuristics might be very negative or harmful to, you know, co-workers, friends, etc. Um, here are a couple heuristics that um, might be helpful or have been helpful, but also maybe are things to be paying attention to or thinking about. So um, availability heuristic, you can see a little uh, a little emoji I've got there. So availability heuristic is something that, you know, we can, because it's information that maybe we recently heard or that we hear kind of frequently or that stands out, it's kind of readily available. It's kind of like at the top of our brain, if you will. Um, so for example, you know, you've probably heard like, oh, shark, you know, a shark attack happened. Like you don't go into the ocean, stay away from the sharks. But if you look at the statistics, I don't know what the exact statistics are, but like the number of people who die in shark, um, you know, shark accidents are so much less than, for example, people who die in car accidents or even plane crashes. And yet like shark attack, it's something that just stands out in our brain. Um, so that's the availability heuristic. Uh, representativeness. So this is, um, this can be helpful in terms of kind of making snap quick decisions. If you see something that's four legs and has a flat surface, you probably think like, well, that's a chair. Um, I think I talked about this in a, in a previous lecture. Um, so you can look at something and go into a room and easily chair, chair, chair. You don't have to like, well, let me think about it. It's got four legs and it's got a back and I don't know. Do I see it? Oh, the, oh, there's the flat surface. I think that's a chair. No, you can look at it and be like, you know, this is a heuristic. It's a chair. Um, if you see little kids, they, they'll do this when they're really little. They'll see four legs and they'll think doggy, doggy. And you'll say, no, that's a horse or no, that's a cat. Um, they have this heuristic very early on. Um, oh, it's a, oh, it's a horse. It's a cow. Um, it's not until they get a little bit older that they realize, okay, well, everything with four legs isn't always a dog. It could also be other animals. Another example of a heuristic is anchoring. So um, this is, you can see here, this is often a sales technique. You've probably seen lots of these like for sale, you know, and there's the slash shoot through is like the meme here. Um, you know, it's off and you're going to save all this money. Um, and so that's great, but usually they've maybe marked it up to them, mark it down or something like that. So it's, you know, a lot of times maybe not actually a sale. Um, but that ends up anchoring us. And in this example, we think, oh, I'm getting such a great price. Um, you know, and so then it helps with sales in this example. So those are some things that, you know, heuristic wise, they can be really helpful um, or help us make snap decisions, but they can in therapy settings be pretty harmful. I feel like we've kind of already talked about this in different ways, but I like this video because I think it just shows it in a slightly different way in terms of how we make assumptions and stereotype people and try and put them into boxes that can be really harmful and it can be not very helpful to whoever we're trying to work with or help in terms of our work with clients. Um, I, again, I like this video. It does, it's made by a religious you know, group or whoever, um, a church maybe. Because right around minute like three or, or towards the end of the video, it gets kind of religious. Um, so if you're not into that, skip that by that point. Um, you know, kind of the, the point of the video is over. Um, but I'll put the link in the description for this. We've kind of talked about, we've talked about being aware on several different sides of things. What I do want to say is that increased awareness, one way to work on that is to kind of really start to ask yourself some of these questions in terms of how am I doing? How am I feeling right now in this moment? Um, how do I want to be responding? And so it's kind of, it's doing mindfulness, but it's in like very snap, very quick, like, all right, how am I doing? How am I feeling right now? You know, am I feeling tense anywhere in my body? What am I thinking right now? Am I hungry? Am I cold? Am I angry? Am I irritated? Am I feeling okay? 
and then that's it. It's like it can take 10 seconds, 30 seconds. You could do it pretty much anywhere. Um, and so sometimes I'll do this, especially if I'm in a meeting that's really intense or I'm talking to someone and it's, it's really intense. Before I respond, I'll just kind of like, all right, how, like this person is talking to me. How am I feeling as they're saying something to me? And do I want to respond in a way that's irritated or snappy at them? Or do I want to respond in a way that's like calm, relaxed, um, you know, and not in an irritated way? And so that's something that's taken a lot of practice to be able to um, really increase that awareness in terms of kind of doing like a like a little 360 check in with myself of how am I doing? And that really increases the awareness in terms of the emotions, in terms of what I'm thinking, um, in terms of how I'm feeling physiologically. Is there tension in my body or am I um, in experiencing any type of um, anxiety symptoms? So try doing that exercise maybe two or three times in the next couple of days in terms of just kind of checking in with yourself to try and increase some of that self-awareness. Um, collaborative approach. Oh, so I taught, I said that I would talk about this earlier in the slide deck. So at the end of therapy, it, at the end of the intake session, I will, I, there's a couple different analogies that I'll use. And I like to use these analogies because I think they really do a good job of one, setting a collaborative tone with the client, but two, um, to really kind of set the tone for therapy. So one of the analogies is I'll use is, uh, you know, I'll say something like uh, we're on a ship, you know, imagine that we're on a ship and you're the ship's captain and you're the one who's setting the course. You're the one who's saying, here are my treatment goals. Here's what I want to focus on. Here's what I want to get out of this. You're at the you're at the one at the wheel. You're the one driving this. And I'm standing next to you and I may be holding that map and saying, okay, this is the map. Here's where you're saying that you want to get to. How do we achieve that? How do we, you know, overcome the the stormy seas? How do we navigate around rocks in the ocean or whatever? You know, how do we not crash onto shore? How do we get you where you're trying to get to? Um, and so that helps the client understand that, yeah, there there are gonna be hard times. Life is not gonna magically get better. Um, but it also helps them understand that they're the one driving this. They're the ones in control here. And I'm just here to kind of be their first mate or, you know, help them out. I'm not a sailor. I don't, maybe, hopefully that was the right term, first mate. Anyways, <laughs> um, another analogy that I'll use is I'll say like, hey, um, you know, imagine that you want to go run a marathon. Have You know, if you haven't run a marathon, there's probably some things that you need to do to prep you know, get ready for that so that you don't go out there and like literally die. Um, and so what would you need to do to prep for that? And they'll say like, well, I probably need to go to the gym a couple times a week, you know, like do some weights. I'll have to start, you know, running regularly um, and kind of build up to that. Like, great. Yeah. Uh, if you go to the gym, you know, five minutes for uh, twice a week, is that going to help you achieve that goal of running a marathon, you know, and feeling great doing it? Like, no, five minutes, you know, twice a week is not going to probably really help me get prepared for that. Like, you're right, it's not. So it's the same with your mental health, right? You have to regularly and consistently work on your mental health, not just here in treatment, you know, not just one hour every week or every other week, but doing something every day that helps your mental health or every other day that helps your mental health. Whether that's five minutes of mindfulness or whether that's going for a walk or whether that's, um, you know, spending some time with loved ones or whatever it is there, you know, you can't just like plan that therapy is going to fix everything or do everything for your mental health. And so that will, again, kind of put the um, and, you know, I'll kind of sometimes I'll say things different ways in terms of using those analogies, depending on what the client and I've talked about. But that helps them understand that, again, the ball is in their court. They're going to they're gonna have to put in work and effort to make this um, change that they want to see and not just expect, you know, that, okay, if I come and talk to you for one week, one hour out of the week, that I'm just going to magically, everything's going to get better. Um, and so those are a couple of the analogies. Something else I'll sometimes say to clients is, you know, there's um, how many hours in a week? There's a hundred and what is it? 86 hours in a week. If you only come in here one hour out of a week, you know, going back to that analogy with the marathon, is that going to be enough for you to make the changes or enough for you to meet your goals? And usually clients are like, no, that's one hour out of that time. That's not very much. 
you're right. So what else do you need to be doing outside of therapy to help you meet your goals? Um, a lot, and I find this helpful for a couple reasons. One is a lot of times people have never been to therapy or a therapist and they don't know what to expect. Um, and you know, sometimes if they have any idea, it's usually from like movies or TV shows, which are horrific. I hate, I hate, ther- I don't, I don't like examples of therapists in movies or TV shows because they're usually really terrible. Um, cause the therapist is portrayed as like, you know, they're doodling and they're on a, a notepad or they're not actually paying attention or listening or they over pathologize the client in some way like I'll tell you what your problem is you have mommy issues just fix that and everything will be fine like ah that's that's not how we as therapists act in actual therapy um and so this also helps them get a better understanding just in terms of kind of what to expect over the course of of therapy um as opposed to like you know in in act ineffective or unhelpful examples from movies or tv shows there is a file on canvas i won't go into it but there's a culturally competent self-assessment on there um, where you can look at it you can take the assessment um, on yourself see how you score and see what areas that you are maybe doing really well on in terms of culturally comp- cultural competence but also maybe what are some areas that you could improve on or work on I won't go into the research article because I said I was going to try and keep this short. Um, This research essentially looked at some of the um, inequities or disparities in terms of minority individuals who go to doctors Um, because there's a lot of disparities or, um, you know, um, a lack of access to resources or some individuals, um, minorities specifically, don't go to their doctor as often as Caucasians do. And so this research essentially uh, looked at that and I'll skip down to the bottom line, the results. So the results essentially said that um, there's a couple different things that people want um, and there was mixed mixed preferences. So one was open communication, um, you know, that people want to be treated nicely. They want to be treated in a respectful and polite way by um, nurses, doctors, um, helping professionals. Um, you know, don't treat me like income or don't treat me like I'm just a paycheck, essentially. And then the other big factor in terms of mixed preference was some people wanted that, um, you know, that tailored approach um, in terms of, you know, I want my doctor to pay attention to those cultural factors um, and really tailor that to me. And other people didn't really care or didn't really, you know, like, oh, it's appropriate in my setting or, you know, in this medical setting that, um, you know, just do your thing as a doctor. I don't really need you to culturally focus it to me specifically. Um, and so I think it's, I think that's really interesting and fascinating because there's a lot of times there's, you know, this is a whole diversity class. The purpose is to, you know, tailor things to client needs and really focus on that. Um, but when you actually go talk to people in terms of this research, at least specifically, Sometimes people said like, well, I don't really need it tailored. I just, you know, want to be treated with respect and care and like, I'm not just a dollar sign to you. Um, So I think that's really interesting because what it basically comes down to is just ask your client, what do they want? Um, Do you want, you know, do you want tailored approach or how do you want to be treated in therapy? And if you just ask them, most of the time they'll tell you. So. That is this week's lecture. Please let me know if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. Thank you.